it's hard to explain to somebody the energy that's in that building, the closeness that you feel, just the aura of it. The reverberation of the spirit. It was a very intimate atmosphere. So intimate and yet so volatile. The fans are so wonderful. And the Straw Hat Band in the rooting section. Yeah, even those of us that couldn't really jump that high managed to jump real high. It's such an amazing place to play. It's, there's so much energy there. I could count on the energy from the fans to, to, to pour over onto the court. You couldn't even hear yourself talk on the floor. You couldn't hear what the coach was saying. And the other team looking over the shoulder, what's going on here? This place is tough to play in. The place was always packed. And People were clamoring for a ticket. Naismith invented the game to be played in gymnasiums like Harmon. How can you get choked up and emotional about a, a gym, but you do? January 13, 1933. Opening night at the University of California's new gymnasium. All the players were elated going into a new gym, larger than other gymnasiums, and larger than our old one. It was a great experience. They have a supporting crowd right there. Yeah. A capacity crowd saw Cal defeat UCLA 40 to 37. After the game, they found out that there was more than a thousand people that couldn't get in that night. And they had an open house, and the gym was crowded for several hours after the game. People touring the building, and seeing the facilities that the university had. Cal's grand new building was called simply Men's Gymnasium. It replaced the original Harmon Gym, a wooden facility built in 1878, a building that had become cramped and obsolete by the 1930s. Old Harmon was a good gym, but only had 3,200 seating capacity only when they set up bleachers. So uh, it was very limited in spectator space. Now Nibs Price's basketball team would have a suitable home court. The Bears would no longer have to play home games off campus at venues like the Oakland Auditorium. And the growing East Bay community would have a place to enjoy the increasingly popular sport of basketball. I grew up in Berkeley and I remember going to all the games at Harmon Gym when I was in grammar school. And we used to sneak into the games beforehand and hide in the men's room. And uh, I can recall doing that several times when we weren't able to do that. There would always be, in the old days, the Cal football players were always on the gate and you'd stand by there and wiggle your ears or do something, they'd say, okay, kid, come on in. The new gymnasium was funded by a gift of nearly a half a million dollars from philanthropist Ernest Cowell. That was also supplemented by six-figure grants from both the Student Fund and the California State Legislature. Original plans called for a seating capacity of 10,000, but its official 7,500 seats still made it easily the largest college arena in the state. Believe it or not, at that time, it held more people than it does now, because I can recall that it held, uh, they announced attendance at some games as 8,200 people. Cal Hoops flourished in the late 30s, capped by a Pacific Coast Conference title in 1939. But world events soon overshadowed athletics. The nation mobilized for World War II, and the gymnasium, not yet a decade old, was also called to serve. The V-12 programs, the various war programs that were going on at that time, used the gym, but it never really interfered with the basketball program. There wasn't as much interest uh, in, in the athletics. They, they didn't uh, sell out the, uh, uh, either the gym, the Harmon gym, or um, the football stadium. But it was a, um, a very noisy place, uh, even then, and uh, the students that did attend uh, were, were very supportive. The years following the war were glory years for men's gym. Nibs Price walked one sideline. The straw hat band occupied the other. Large and passionate crowds once again became the norm in Berkeley. Coming back out of the war, uh, I think that uh, not only students, but, but fans in general of the game were uh, enthusiastic about sports. Harmon seated uh, 7,500 people and, you know, we packed the place. The Bears packed the building for the PCC playoff series in 1946 and 48. In the final game of the 48 series against Washington, Andy Wolf set what was then a school scoring record with 28 points. Even though we lost to Washington, he put on the greatest single exhibition of basketball I'd ever seen up to that time. Nibs Price led the Bears to one more Southern Division title in 1953. The following year, the only Cal coach the gym had ever known stepped down. 
No other coach would win 100 games at Harmon. Nibs Price won 236. I was following a legend, and because Nibs Price was that. He was just a wonderful man. Pete Newell didn't create his own legend right away. In his first year, Cal finished 1-11 in the PCC. But eventually, Newell developed a style of basketball that meshed perfectly the intensity of the Bears' home court. We full court press most of the time. Uh, it must have looked like the teams that we were playing against that the court must have shrunk by about 50 feet. There was always a period, oh, about six, seven minutes into the game, that they'd be trading baskets, and then all of a sudden, Cal would make a run because and it would always start with the defense. They would steal the ball. They'd put so much pressure on the guy bringing it up that he'd get flustered, throw it away, and then they'd, they'd make a couple of quick baskets that way, and, and then the game would just turn around, and of course, the place would just go crazy. At least once, the fervor of the crowd cost Cal a game. The 1956 forfeit to USC, the infamous hot penny game. It was a TV game, and there weren't too many TV games in those days. And uh, they, forward, they had to forfeit the game because they were throwing hot pennies down on the floor. And Al Leitner, who was the referee, picked one of them up, and he got burned because he used to you know, light them <laughs> pennies, throw them on the floor. And even though we warmed the uh, student body, it still it didn't matter because uh, that's the way it was. While Berkeley had the Bay Area's most raucous facility, San Francisco had its best player, Bill Russell. In 1956, the Dons came to Cal with a 47-game winning streak on their way to a second straight national title. After four minutes of the second half, I think there was about a two or three point difference in the game. Put in Joe, Joe Hagler, and, and Joe was about 245, 50 pounds and a little overweight. <laughs> kind of built like a Coca-Cola bottle, actually. And uh, so I said, Joe, I said, you just try to bring that Russell away from the basket. And all of a sudden, he goes out there with a the ball, and nobody goes to pick him up. And poor Joe, first of all, he had to go to the bathroom. And <laughs> he's standing there with the ball, and he's expecting somebody to do something so that, you know, he. But, the more he thought about it, the worse it got. Russell still wouldn't come out. So he held it. We had to held the ball maybe eight, eight minutes. They let us hold it eight minutes. They finally ended up winning by about eight points. And I remember Bob Ferry, who was a coach at, at Santa Clara, he said, Peter, it was a hell of an idea, but let me tell you something. If you're ever going to play like that, win it. 